Lord a hand clap of praise. Oh, yes. He's worthy. He's worthy. Bless that name of the Lord. Before you're seated, I just want to tell you one thing. From front to back, from side to side. The devil is still a liar. I didn't know that I was going to be facing some health issues. But I'm glad to tell you that God's still on the throne. He's still a healer. Brother Booker, Brother Joel Booker, that is, and I was talking this past week. And he said, Brother Holmes, are you coming? I said, I'm coming if I had to come in an ambulance. <laughs> And you know why I say that? Because I'm mad at the devil. But I can tell you, I'm not in an ambulance. And I've never felt any better than what I feel tonight. So the devil is under our feet. received and how many people have told me they were praying for me and I want to thank every one of you I want to thank my wife Sister Johnette for her help in this time of my life my son Pastor Nathan Holmes Sister Mandy my daughter my daughter Andrea Seifert and Roger Seifert Clint and Wendy Bourne, I appreciate all of them. Appreciate all the ministers, and prayers, and texts, and kind things you've said. Thank you so much. I'm sure blessed to have wonderful sons in the gospel. And I had one remind me you got daughters in the gospel too. So I'm grateful for every one of them. And then God has blessed me to have, and you should feel this way about your church, the best church on earth, the saints of the First Pentecostal Church in North Little Rock. What a blessing they've been. All you pastors, evangelists, and everyone that is gathered here tonight, thank you, Brother Jeff Dykes, for opening up your church. We had a prayer meeting over there today, back over there uh, later this afternoon. Thank God for First Apostolic Church of Tulsa, Oklahoma. 
I come here when I was about eight years old to that church. Some of the greatest people, C.P. and Mary Williams, great friends of my father. And I preached there when I was 17 years old in that church. They stood for this glorious truth, great people. And I'm glad that church is carrying on tonight. It's healthy and strong and doing well. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God for it. Thank God for all of you people. Thank you for every one of you that's prayed for me today. I'm honored and I appreciate your prayers and your love. Hallelujah. There is just nothing like God's people. God's real people. Thank God for it. Amen. If you want to stand together, I'll get you to pray with me. Could I get you to reach your hands in this direction? Amen. Would you reach your hand toward this pulpit? Would you ask the Holy Ghost to help us for the next few minutes? God, I need your help. Oh, I believe you, God. Yes, Lord, I believe you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. First Samuel 16 and 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thy horn with oil, and go, and I will send you to Jesse. Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Again, Jesse made seven, the tenth verse. Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not set down till he come hither. And I want to preach to you by the help of the Holy Ghost. We're not fixing to set down. We're going to hold on and keep standing. One more time, pray with me all over this house. Why don't you join up with somebody? If it's appropriate, reach over and join. Come on, prayer warriors. You that are way up in the, at the top, come on, you're going to help me all the way up there. Oh, yes. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless you. You can be seated. I want to say to you tonight, and I've said this before every time the years that we've come here, thank God for peak. Some of the men in this church, ministers, saints alike, possibly, that was at PSR many years ago, it has that same feeling, feeling of consecration and dedication and love for the truth. Thank God for these men, this youth committee, that's made up in their mind, we're going to seek for the old paths and we're not going to sit down. Y'all stand up, youth committee. Come out here, youth committee. Come on out here by me. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I'm a... I told Brother Booker when I got here tonight, I said I probably should be in the nursing home, but here I am at a youth conference. 
the doctor oncologist, she told me, she said, well, you be careful. I said, well, we're going to Tulsa to preach. And she said, I said, there's about 5,000 young people screaming and shouting. She said, well, let me tell you something. Young people care vi viruses that older people don't care. When they, get, when they get a virus, they have to go to bed. But these young people have got it and don't even know they've got it. <laughs> Amen. But I thank God for a group of young men that's still standing in Pentecost tonight. I'm sorry, but this is a crazy world and a Pentecostal world we're living in. You know what's wrong? It's young preachers and pastors that get star-minded and they're always trying to find some star. Hey, we don't need a star. We need the man that hung the stars. You know, we're located on Interstate 40. I can't tell you how many gospel, so-called gospel groups have called and said, we'd like to come sing for y'all. Well, you go somewhere else and sing. Oh, yeah, they could draw a crowd, but I want to tell you that's not the crowd we're looking for. We're looking for the crowd that John the Baptist that's ready to repent. You know, they do that deal, ring on and ring off. You know, when I sing for you, ring off, ring on when I leave. You wouldn't let saints do that. You wouldn't let them get on the platform. Hey, I feel, I, I've got a burden. You may think I'm just, there ain't no ring on, ring off. We don't need nobody to prop us up. The Holy Ghost has done propped us up. Why would we be kidding ourselves trying to find a star? We don't need a star in Pentecost. We need a devil stomping, Holy Ghost filled pastor. Thank God for young men that are still seeking for the old past. You know what you need to do? You just need to decide who you are. You need to figure out which side you're going to be on. I feel like Joshua. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Come on, join up with somebody. I'm believing that God will give us a, a life-changing service tonight. Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you, brothers. I salute you, every one of the young pastors in this church, along with my son, that I take a stand. I want to wave you on. I want to lift up your hand. I want to tell you how much I love you. I want to tell you how proud I am of you. Oh, yeah, the devil's going to get a stomping before this is over tonight. I feel it coming on. We don't need a show in Pentecost. We need a revival in Pentecost. I want to tell you, we found out how to revival. You know where the revival is at? It's under these pews and under these chairs. We need an anointing in Pentecost. We need to be real in Pentecost. You're real when you're in vacation, on vacation. You're real when you're at home. It's the same message. It's the same truth. I remember many years ago, I was a young pastor. Back in the 70s. 
and there came a man out of Fort Worth that was setting the woods on fire and everybody was trying to imitate him. But they had a different twist to everything. It was this showmanship. It was this talent. It was speaking great swelling words of men's wisdom. And here I am just a young pastor and they're telling you how to build a church. They're telling you if you'll do this, and you'll do that and you'll get on television or you'll allow us, we'll send you all the leads that we get in your area if you'll help support it. Thank God for an old time mother and daddy. Hey, we need some old timers that won't flinch. And I remember the morning the Holy Ghost hit me. We had about 150 people. And I got up in front of that church on that Sunday morning preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And I said, I want to tell you people something. I'm not fixing to change if this church goes to 50 or it goes to 500. I'm going to stand for the old paths. I'm going to preach this truth. I'm going to preach holiness, separation from the world, that girls are not supposed to cut their hair, that men are supposed to get haircuts. And I've watched God work. He made a liar out of the devil. I can tell you that. Young press pastors and preachers and saints, get behind your pastor, get behind your man of God. Support him, hold up his hands, live what he preaches, and watch God give revival. I don't want to show. I don't want to play with people. I don't want people that's not committed. And I want to tell you, when you tickle people under their chin and you get them in, you got to keep tickling them, brother, ain't he? You got to keep playing with their emotions. When you put their feet on this rock and you preach this truth to them and they get it in their heart, hell can't move them. I'm sorry, I got to looking around the church the other day during service, and here's the, these people, and over here and all around, people that's been with us 30 years and 50 years, rock solid. That's what preaching will do. You better put people's feet on the rock. And if you're playing games with them, you're probably going to get voted out before it's over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I know a God that's in charge. You come against this truth, you're not taking on your pastor. You're taking on a God that can shut your mouth. Hey, you know the burden of my message tonight, you know what it is? That every young person would support your pastor. You would love your church. Don't be thinking about some other church. You love your church. You love your man of God. You be faithful to your man of God. You be loyal to your man of God. That's the burden of my heart tonight. I know this much about preaching and pastoring. If I can help weld you to your man of God, you're going to be all right. You just got to get behind him. You got to hold up his hands. You got to preach with him when he preaches. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Last Sunday night, I got stirred up at our church. It scares me. I look and see precious people sitting in the pew. Son preached a marvelous message. And they were sitting there just kind of, They're precious people. They've been with me for years. But I'm going to tell you, they're not going to stay with me. 
They're not going to stay with sun if something don't wake up in them. How can you come to a party and just sit on your hands? There's something wrong. Somebody better pull the fire alarm and say, wake up, precious saints. I'm talking about saints that's living the life, just sitting there. Never raise their hand, never clap their hands, never stand up. A third of the church standing up and two-thirds sitting down when they all are to be on their feet. Hey, if you stand up here while I'm preaching and you go home Sunday morning and sit on your pastor, you know what you are? You figure it out. There's a... They call it hypocrite. You are to be on your feet. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost, help us. Come on, take somebody with the hand and pray right now. I know what's going to happen to you. I told them Sunday night what was going to happen to them. You're going to be like the prodigal son. He came home. That daddy had that calf in that stall and he'd been feeding him every day because he said that boy's going to come home and when he gets home, we're going to have a party. We're going to have a party. Oh, uh, the devil hates it. I've stirred up the devil telling people, welcome to the party. Hey, this world ain't got no party. We've got the only party going. And you know what the devil wants to do to people? He wants to make people sit down and fold their hands when they come to the party. In fact, when I was a young boy, they told us how much you had to sacrifice and how hard it was to live for God. And what you all you had to give up. You don't have to give up anything. You get to give it up. One day I got the revelation. I started preaching to them. It's a party, friend. You come to church, we're going to party. We're going to shout and dance and run the aisles. In fact, my old daddy told me, son, you can't let people sit on them pews. Where's that drum at? Oh, uh, yeah, you can't let people sit on those pews. They'll dry up. They'll backslide. You know what will happen to them? Can I tell you what will happen? The spirit that got on that elder son will get on them. And they're standing off while you're having church and, and people are running the aisles and the band's playing. And it's rocking in that place. Hey, that's not... The devil's term, that's our term. They're standing somewhere off back somewhere, looking down their nose. That song's too fast. That PA system's turned up too loud. They're preaching too long. Yeah, yeah. Yes! Yes! Thank you. I was praying over Brother Dyke's church, church today, and I saw that drum, and I called him. I said, Brother, do you mind if I bring it with me tonight? He said, bring it on. I said, well, if somebody steals it like they did all my tambourines, I'll buy you another one. He said, I ain't worried about it. I said, well, we may need to wake up this place. Another reason I wanted to bring it, it's a symbol of my daddy that loved worship. There's nobody I have ever met in my life that loved to worship God more than my dad did. Hallelujah. Thank God for real Pentecost.
Hey, when you find one of those elder sons in your church that's standing on the sideline and they're criticizing the pastor, you know, just, oh, no. somebody said the other day to me, said, I walked in the restaurant, shook the hand, they said, you sure are getting long-winded. Yeah, you're an elder son, too. Here I'm preaching under the anointing. You worried about how long I'm going to preach. If you want to be set free, listen to the preaching. When you see one of them elder sons getting close to you and start that stuff, first thing you need to do, you need to let them know whose side you're on. I love my pastor. I love my church. I love my church family. And I'm not going to the church across town or 500 miles away. I'm happy where I'm at, and I'm going to stay where I'm at. This is the burden of my heart tonight. You can be seated. Y'all got to help me or we're not going to get through here tonight. Brothers, when I was praying about this service, did you know this peak is going to affect, think about it, the next 50 years of Pentecost? If these people get this in their heart and they get anchored on the rock, Pentecost is going to be in good shape 50 years from now because young people at peak made consecrations. Now, if all you're doing is shouting in the motions of the preaching, you're not listening to what I'm saying. What I'm saying to you, that you would have a backbone. Where's that cell phone at? That you would have a backbone, and you would say, I'm not going to go to those sites. I'm not going to watch Hollywood clips. I'm not going to watch the ball games. I'm believing that the Holy Ghost tonight, that God's going to touch some backbones tonight, that you're going to stand up and you're going to take a stand, and God's going to make this a life-changing service that you will never go back. Yes, everybody's made some mistakes, but I'm going to tell you what to do when you make a mistake. Jump up. Jump up and go at the devil again with a made-up mind. I'm going to live for God. Oh, God, help us tonight. We're not going to sit down. What my wish is, you can be seated. Sit down. You're not going to sit down. My prayer tonight is this. First of all, that you would love your pastor and that God would heal our ears to where we can hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear. You can have an ear and still can't hear. When you don't ask for counsel, when you don't seek for people to help guide you, you're making a horrible mistake. You need your pastor in your life, and you need, come on, why don't we do it right now? Put your hand on your ears. Come on, let's pray for our ears tonight. God, give us ears to hear. Give us, come on, church. Come on, young people. Heal my ears, God, and let me hear. Let me tell you what my prayer is for. You know, really and truthfully, until you fall in love with the man of God that God has put in your life, you can't fall in love with the doctrine. You can't fall in love with holiness. 
You can't fall in love with paying your tithes. Oh, I'm a young person. I don't care how young you are. If you're getting an allowance. Do you want to get blessed? Would you like to drive fine cars and live in a nice home and watch God open the windows of heaven? Don't you miss paying your tithes, young people. I don't care if it's $10 and one dollar belongs to God and an offering belongs to him. Well, hallelujah. Y'all sit down, y'all making those ones that are sitting down look bad. Maybe they hadn't paid their tithes. If you want to get blessed, friend, you get on God's. You get on God's, not Dennis Rainey, but get on God's financial plan. And you watch God work. My prayer for every one of you here tonight is that God would bless you with a prayer life. It will change everything about you when you make up your mind every day of my life. It doesn't matter if it's backing up. It doesn't matter if it's going sideways. It doesn't matter if it's going forward. It doesn't matter what's going on in my life. There's one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to be praying. Come on, young people. Start now. Start now. You say something about prayer? It's a revelation. You got to have it. You want to be blessed. You want to watch God work in your life. You want the victories and the miracles that God has for you. You can be seated. I read my scripture text to you tonight about a man, a great man of God. His name was Samuel. And he said, I'm not going to sit down until you get David here. Praying and seeking God over that, it carried me back to the beginning of Samuel's life, his walk with God, how he heard from God, how God led him, how the hand of God was upon him. And then one day God spoke to him, and he said, there's going to be a man coming. The day before he got there, God told him, Saul's coming, and you're going to anoint Saul to be king. And I got to thinking about the comparison between Saul and David and how Saul, hey, God has not set you up for failure. You know, I never really looked seriously at Saul and his life. But it's recorded in the word of the Lord that he was, a, he was a chosen young man. There was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person. That's what the Bible says. He was the best of the best. He stood shoulder and upward taller than anybody in Israel. He came before Samuel looking for some mules. And God spoke to Samuel, and he said, Saul, God's got purpose in your life. And you know what the purpose of God in your life is? You're going to deliver Israel from the Philistines. God's got his hand on you, Saul. God's going to use you. The anointing is upon you. He brought him into his house where there were 30 that were dining together. He put him at the chief, the Bible said, spot at the table. He brought him the shoulder, which represented strength, and he had that shelf to set it in front of Saul. And then the scripture said that he took Saul and went up on top of the house and communed with him. And when it come time to send him on his way, this is the second time, he says, send the men ahead. 
because I want to talk to you. And he sent them away, and he said, I want to tell you what the Lord has showed me, and I want to give you the word of the Lord, Saul. The hand of God was upon him. Then before he left, he poured oil on him. That was his first anointing. And he kissed him and sent him on his way. The second time he pours oil on him, it's in front of the children of Israel. And they're searching for Saul and they cannot find him. And Saul says to Samuel, I'm of the least of the tribe. My family's way back on the back side of the track. I'm the least of the least. I come to preach to some young person. You ain't driving a sports car tonight. You don't have a lot of money. You don't have a lot of support. But I'm going to tell you, if God is on your side... You can be a no-name. You see the humility in him when it comes time for Samuel and all the children of Israel standing in front of him and Saul standing, Samuel standing there with the oil and they say, bring, bring Saul back to his house. Kish's house and family has already passed in front of Samuel. And he says, well, where's Saul? And they cannot find him because he's hid, the Bible said, among the stuff. They inquired of the Lord and they bring Sam, Saul out to be anointed as king. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him in a mighty way. His first great battle, Jabesh, the man came to Nahash. And they said, you know what? We don't want to be destroyed. We'll make a deal with you. We'll pay taxes or we'll do whatever you want us to do. We're going to compromise. Now this is what happens when you start compromising. You never stop. You know what Nahash said to them? They said, good deal. We're happy to do it. We want to take every one of you men and gouge out your right eye. Brother, I'm going to tell you, when you back up a little bit, there ain't no stopping to that backing up. The devil don't want just your church. He wants to put out your eye where you cannot see the truth and you compromise with the world. And the anointing of God came up on Saul. And Saul took a, a, a yoke of oxen. He chopped them to pieces. He sent them out through Israel. And he said, if you don't show up for war, this is what's going to happen to your pickup trucks and your tractors, because that's what they used them for. We're going to chop up your oxen. The Bible said 300,000 men of Israel. 30,000 from Judah came. He had an army of 330,000 men to go fight. And I want you to get this. Because this is the only time it happened for poor old Saul. He said, you come after Saul. Saul. And you come after Samuel. You'll read where it was just Saul and Samuel together. You won't read that anymore. The Bible said after a year, in the second year, something had happened to his spirit. I'm preaching to you tonight. You better watch when something happens to your spirit. You no longer have an ear to hear. Samuel is pushed out of his life. He gets the big head. Jonathan goes down and jumps on a garrison 
of the Philistines. If you want to know what that is, that was an outpost. That was probably about 600 men. He went down there and gave them a whipping. You know what Saul did? Here, here's the ego of God deliver us from jealousy and ego. Quit worrying about who gets the credit. Who cares who gets the credit? You know what Saul did? The Bible said Saul blew a trumpet throughout all Israel. Whoop, 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 whoop. Saul is the one that won this battle. Saul wasn't even there. It was Jonathan, his boy, that had won the battle. But he was wanting to take the credit. Look who I am. Deliver us, God. Just get the ball across the line. Let's just win the battle. Who cares who does what? I'm going to tell you, if God could set us free from jealousy and envy and strife, our churches would totally change. People get so worried about who's going to sing and who gets the part and who didn't get the part and who will get the part. Saul, that's what's wrong with you. You're on an ego trip, Saul. You're on an ego trip, Saul. You're all messed up in your thinking, Saul. You can be seated. What Jonathan did, he just stirred them up enough that those Philistines came out of their nest. The Bible said 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen. The Bible said there were men, it was like a sea. Have you ever seen one of those pictures painted of a war and, you know, just on and on and on. No way to count all the people that, the warriors that had showed up. And they're standing on the doorstep of Saul. Now, Saul, do you want to take the credit? Instead of stopping and going to a Holy Ghost prayer meeting and praying through and getting a hold of Samuel, and say, Samuel, we got some problems here, but it's not too big for our God. It's not too big for our God. Let me tell you something. If God is for you, it does not matter one bit what your enemies do or say. His, his ego was so messed up, you'd be seated. He was so twisted up in his mind, he couldn't even look back and think, how did we win that other battle? It was Saul. you got to come after Saul and Samuel. He can't think straight. The people are nervous. His army's down. He's only got a few men in that army. I'm going to tell you, it's God that draws people together. Oh, it's great preaching. You got you to gotta let up. You got to have beards and televisions and let people get by with a bunch of junk. Or you can't have a church. You know what's wrong? People are getting baptized that's not repenting. Back home, we still believe it. For you get baptized, bring forth fruit, meat. Hey, we're not in competition with nobody. I don't care how many you baptized. We're going to baptize everybody. We can baptize too. But I'm going to tell you something. They're not going to come in there and get baptized. And a woman put on man's garment and put them garments back on and walk out of that church. Because the Bible said that's an abomination. You're talking about deceiving people. You're deceiving people when you don't tell them the truth. And let me tell you something. You don't have nothing. You just got them wet. 
And that's what I tell people. You can go home and stand in the shower with your clothes on and get wet. We're not interested in getting you wet. We're interested in getting you converted. Somebody said, I baptized 800. I hope you baptized 8,000. But if you didn't tell them the truth and draw the line and say, before we baptize you, you're going to have to have a Bible study. There's some things going to have to change in your life. Well, somebody said it won't work. Well, I can tell you it's worked for me. Because if God be for you, who can be against you? Come on, young people. Get it in your heart. Get it in your heart. Don't be a compromiser. Hey, young people, listen to me. God sent me here tonight to tell you. Come here, Brother Jackson. Whatever you do, y'all be seated. Hold on to your Samuel. Samuel, me and you are going to go every step of the way. Hey, God had already told Samuel, I have called Saul. Did you know God has called every one of you? God's called you to do a mighty work. It may be write a check for the wing off of a, the new church or a new auditorium. Boy, I tell you, y'all got off the bus then, didn't you? Did you know God told Samuel, I have called Saul, and Saul is going to deliver my people from the Philistines. But he had a train wreck because he got lifted up in his spirit. He was not seeking the counsel of Saul and say, Saul, what do you think we're to do? How should we move? What, 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 what should, his ego was so big that because Samuel did not show up at the right time, he thought, oh, you better listen to me. You better quit saying my pastor should have done this and he should have done that. You need to get the Holy Ghost what you need to get. Are y'all hearing me up here in the nosebleed section? I want y'all to stand up and clap. <laughs> Young people, do you hear me tonight? I'm an old pastor preacher. I don't know how many more times I got to preach, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to preach every time I get a chance. It would have been easy to tell them, no, I'm not going to come. And in my flesh, I could have listened to that. <clears throat> because I know I've had my day. I've had a great day. I don't need anything. But I don't work for y'all. I work for him. <laughs> the only reason I'm here tonight is because of him. I told my son when I went through that operation, I said, son, God's dealing with me more about peak than he is our camp meeting. And I'm glad you're letting me empty my heart out tonight because I want to tell you something. If you ever turn loose your Samuel, the Philistines are going to come with 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and soldiers that you can't even count. But if you hold on to Samuel, if you lock arms with him, if you say, Samuel, it's me and you, we're going to go down swinging. Yeah, we, we don't know what's going to happen, but I can tell you something. I, I can tell you something. Samuel, if they kill you, they're going to kill me because we're sticking this thing out. We're going to make it together. And whatever you tell me, that's what I'm going to do. Boy, 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 God deliver us from this ego. I think we ought to pray right now. You do it. I think we ought to pray right now. Why do you care who gives the biggest offering? Why do you care who sings, plays the instruments? 
Why do you care who preaches at peak? Just the will of God be done. Just the will of God be done. God wants to set us free. Come on, young people. Why don't you pray for your pastor right now? If your pastor is here, why don't you reach your hand in his direction? If you know where he's seated in this great auditorium tonight, in this great arena, come on, pray for him. Pray God to give him wisdom. Pray God to give him strength. I want you to, I want you to let him know in the next few days, Pastor, I'm with you. I love you, Pastor. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. You're going to guide me. You're going to lead me. I'm not on no ego trip. I love you, Brother Pastor. You're the best preacher in the world. We got the best church in the world. I love my church. I love my pastor. I love the pastor's wife. I love the pastor's family. I love everything about the church. There's nothing about the church that I don't love. Help us, Holy Ghost. It was a sad day, folks. It was a sad day because he did not have an ear to listen. You can be seated. You know what? The man of God, Samuel, shows up. And here's what was the revelation to me in this study and God laying this on my heart. I did not realize how much Samuel loved Saul so much. The Bible said he cried all night. Wept for him, oh God. In fact, God said, Samuel, quit mourning crying over Saul. I've rejected him. He told him twice. Get up, Samuel. Go get your oil. I've got somebody else that'll do my work. I'm scared of God. I'm going to tell you, and I'm not saying this in a light manner. But if you don't fear God, you are a fool. I've, I've said it to the church a couple of times or maybe more. I've said, church, you better stay with this truth and you better stay with this man of God. I didn't put him there. God put my son in there. I wouldn't do my church that way for nothing in the world. It's got to be the will of God. It's got to be the call of God. Oh, yes, sir. God put him in there. And you know what I told him? I said, y'all better stay with this message. Because <laughs> I felt the spirit of prophecy on me. I said, don't you think for one minute that God can't put a for sale sign out there in front of all them columns? Big, hey, I can see it. It, it, God, it was God speaking to me. Church for sale in front of First Pentecostal Church. Them all running around trying to find some smaller building because I'm going to tell you, you get too small a crowd, they can't pay the electric bill. They'd have to do something. Well, $22,000 a month. Somebody better show up and write some checks. I'm not going to tell you, it ain't no problem now at all. Because it's God that has done it. But the reason God has done it, we fell hell tone. Hey, I, I'm scared to death of God. Hey, don't start that play in church with me. I don't care how well they can sing. I don't care how well they can play instruments. Don't get on the platform. You're going to get yourself in trouble with God. You're going to get yourself in trouble with God. Somebody said, well, the saints don't really know how they live when they leave. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Instagram? Are you still in the dark ages? Have you ever heard of Facebook? Don't tell me they don't see rings and short sleeves. And... You know what you're doing when you do that? You're confusing your saints. 
they don't know which side you're really on. What gets me, all this has happened way before they come along. That's what blows my mind. Building paid off. Millions of dollars in the building account, treasure. Ready, poised to build a new building. And then food with a half-bred Pentecost. Hey, I'm scared of God. I know what got me to where I'm at. I held on to my Samuel. <laughs> Sister Liz, bring it up. Y'all can be seated. I'm going to show you a few of the Samuels. It's been a blessing in my life. Oh, let me tell you this. Right there is a Samuel. You're looking at my mother. My mother was a Esther. She was a Deborah. There's nobody that taught me more about human relations than that woman right there. She had a deep insight. Hey, it's not what you say to people. It's how you make people feel. And when they're talking to you and you're walking away, when you don't return a text and you don't answer their call, they get a message pretty quick. They're not very important. But I found out, I've lived long enough to find out that the one you don't think all that's important, someday he'll write $4.6 million check. That's a seed money of where we're at today. He was a, just a young boy in our church playing the drums, and he grew up, and he was mad. You know what made him mad? He knew we were mocked and made fun of as Pentecost. We were the Pentecostals that the Pentecostals made fun of. You know what made him laugh at us? You see that old drum sitting over there? We was beating the drum, running the aisles, rolling the fours, shouting the victory, Woo! preaching holiness. <laughs> they thought we was goofy. They found out who was goofy. seated. Don't think God can't do it. Oh, I don't know how on earth we'll kill those Philistines. You just need Samuel's all you need. I guarantee you they ain't a doubt in my mind. They would have slayed every one of them devils if Saul would have kept that right spirit. You read it in your Bible. He said, I've called Saul to deliver my people. He had purpose in it. Oh, I've come to preach to all you young people. God's got purpose in your life. Don't train wreck. Don't get foolish. You know what you'll find yourself? You'll find yourself where Saul was at. End of his life, the Bible said he took a sword and he said to his armor bearers, slay me for these uncircumcised Philistines mock me and make fun of me. The very ones that you were supposed to kill are now killing you. He couldn't stand for them to kill him. He couldn't stand for them to take him through the city, poke out his eyes like Samson was done. He couldn't stand it. So I just see it in my mind. He rolls two big old stones together. The armor bearer won't slay him. He wedges his sword down between those big rocks. He takes a step or two back. He runs and makes a fall on that sword and takes his life because his ego was too big. He didn't want to hear an old-fashioned woman like that. Oh, Lord, I preached the truth, told it like it was. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Give me another slide, sister. There's my daddy, my drum-beating daddy. He was a Samuel that held on to this. Do it again. <laughs> Two great people in my life. You don't know who that is? That's brother and sister Burr. 
my first wife's parents, Brother Burr was like a rock. He was a rock to me. God only knows where I'd be tonight if it hadn't been for those folks in my life. You know what? You know what always got my attention? You know, I've never been accused of being very smart because I'm not. Really, I should have been working at Walmart. Greedy people. Come on in here. But you know what always got me? Brother Burr would tell me something, and I didn't like what he told me. And if you like everything Samuel tells you, you ain't listening right. You better just be sure you're trying to get Samuel to talk to you. And I, I'd go down to Port Arthur, and I'd be hungry and thirsty because I wanted to build a church. I wanted to see the work of God go forward. And he'd tell me things that I didn't like, but I'd always, I've always done it. I'd put it in the back of my head. And then I would watch, and I'd watch how it played out. You know, an idiot finally will wake up. When you see a man right over and over and over and over and over, and then you're too dumb to listen, you wrote the book on it. You need to get your picture by the word in the dictionary. Dumb. I'm glad to tell you his precious wife, she's still in our church today. 92 years old. She was there Sunday night. Come on, sisters, we've got to get through. Dean and Medibel Martin, some great people that impacted my life. Great people. There's, there's a prayer warrior. This lady impacted me because she was so consistent in her prayer life. She's 92 years old. I will guarantee you she was at the church today. Walk in the aisles, pray it. She don't miss a day. She was my school teacher. I got to notice in her. In fact, to be honest with you, as a, just a young boy, I fell in love with her. She was single. I wanted to marry her. She wasn't put out about 40 years older than me. That don't matter to a kid that loves his school teacher. You know what she'd do? When she got through school work, she taught in a Christian school, and she'd go down to the auditorium. The school was on the top level of the school. Church was on the bottom. At 5 o'clock, you could set your watch by her. She was going to be in there praying. And she'd pray from 5 to 6. Well, I'm going to tell you, that got a hold of me. And I was about 13 years old. And you know what I did? I started doing the same thing. I'd go down there and I'd kneel 30 minutes. Now, an hour for a 13-year-old is a long time. I'd look at that clock on the back wall of the church, and it looked like it had, the batteries had run out on it. I don't know why they had it back there, because those preachers never paid a bit of attention to it. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking now. Let's move on. <laughs> Quick. Here's a heartbreaking story. This is John. I'm not going to give you the last name. John was raised in our church, in our school, went to our church. It was so sad. He ended up on drugs, homeless, prescription drugs, and died. These are, these are some that I've, seven years ago, one funeral home told me I had preached over a 1,000 funerals with that one funeral home. There's about four big funeral homes in our city. This is one of them I preached. Go to the next one. This is Hoyt. I went to school with. I preached his funeral. He died 31 years old. He was so full of rebellion. He would not pray. We'd have school assembly. Everybody would be crying and praying, not Hoyt. Next one. This is Daniel. He got in a fight with his girlfriend. He dared her. He said, shoot me. She pulled the trigger and killed him. Just a young man went out into eternity. Here's David a gambler. Here's Joanne, a girl that hated holiness. Here's Larry, her husband, who she led around by the nose. Hallelujah. Here's the next one. 
another Larry. Larry was such a fine young man. He got in a scuffle with his brother. Guess what? His younger brother, Jerry, shot him, killed him. Here is Sarah, had a car wreck when she was drinking and killed two of her children. She died later of an overdose on prescription drugs. Here's Johnny, full of rebellion, a boy I went to sit in class with from first grade all the way through. Here's Jackie, he, that's a very young picture of him. He was much older when this happened, but I preached his funeral. He murdered Robin, a girl that my daddy had raised. She had lived in our home. Robin, he took her, tied her to a bedpost and shot her like an animal. I'll never forget the message I preached. God gave it to me. I preached the 23rd Psalms backward, backwards. The Lord is not my shepherd. I shall always want. And I went through all the whole 23rd Psalms, what God laid up on my heart. Here's Edith. He wouldn't, wouldn't let her, her family drive her on the church parking lot. Told them. She said, I've sold my soul to the devil. Preached her funeral. Here's Wayne, one of the finest, most promising young men in our school, drinking one night. The police got after him. They'd stole an outboard motor. They were driving too fast and hit the ditch. And evidently, that outboard motor come around and hit him in the head, and he went out into eternity. Here's, I just talked to this young man, Tim. He told me to tell y'all, this is Tim Carmichael. He was a young man raised in our church. Drinking one night, playing around one night. A man, he's fooling with another man's wife. The man gets after him, and he's choking him. He's in his car. He's almost got away, almost got the door closed. And that man had his hands around his throat, and he was choking him. And Tim had a little 25 automatic under the seat. He reached under the seat and pulled it out and shot the man through his heart. The man took about four steps and fell dead. He's been in the penitentiary for 34 years. He's full of the Holy Ghost tonight, but it cost him a whole lot to get there. Here's Arlene. This is my sister that got away from God. But you know what? She had a stepmother called my mother that wouldn't give up, and she kept praying. And almost on her deathbed, she, my mother, and Sister Alice went out there, laid hands on her, and she went to talking in tongues before she went out into eternity. The last one is my brother. This is Rubel, my brother. Now, you're looking at the man that should have been up here preaching tonight. Rubel was brilliant. He was amazing. He played almost any instrument, any instrument. He was, he was a scholar. He was, it was amazing. But you know what? He did not want to live for God. He told me later, he said, now, Joel, I understand why I didn't want to live for God. I never got the Holy Ghost. Everybody thought they got the Holy Ghost. Hey, I'd just like to warn somebody tonight. If you're children, you need to make sure they get the Holy Ghost. They used to take Rubel and stand him up on the platform, and he'd preach Acts 238 when he was six years old. But, brother, he got away, and he, he hated the things of God. But he'd come down with cancer, and God got a hold of his heart. I've never seen anybody con convert quicker and bigger. He called lawyer friends, doctors that he'd done business with, all kind of people. He told them about this Holy Ghost. He told backsliders about it, everybody he could get a hold of. It was a glorious Sunday morning. I had turned 55 on that Sunday morning. Guess what? Rubel walked right down to the front. It was on this side of the pulpit. He stood about right here. He lifted up his hands. We walked down, put our hands while the singing was going on, and he went to talking in tongues. He walked with me up on the platform. I walked him to the baptistry, and I baptized him in Jesus' name on that Sunday morning. Oh! I know what some of y'all are saying, oh, Brother Holmes, you don't have no elders in your life, but I'm here to tell you I do have elders. And I do have people I'm listening to. And I want you to, I appreciate them tonight, and they're in this, number of them are in this building. You recognize that man right there? 
He's a Samuel. If he called me tonight and said anything, you don't think I'd stop and listen? Hey, listen to me. We better not get so close to one another. Brother, go there that we're afraid to tell one another. Brother, you missed the mark there. Hey, I can't play no game. I'm not going to play no game. I ain't never been nobody. I'm not trying to be anybody. I'm not trying to go nowhere. I'm not trying to do anything, but I'm in love with this truth. You're looking at another elder in my life. He texted me before this service. He said, Brother Holmes, I wished I could be with you tonight, but no, I'm praying for you. You don't think if Johnny Godare picked up the phone and called me that I wouldn't stop in my tracks? Hey, elders, we need to tell the young men. I want to tell you how I've always done it. You know the way I pastored back home? If they didn't want to hear me, I didn't say a word to them because you're wasting your breath. And then when they asked me, you know what I've done to them? I speak to them in parables. Because if they don't want it, they'll not figure it out. And you can slap them up the side of the head with it if you want to. And it won't do a bit of good. Well, hallelujah. What does that mean? You've got to be hungry to hear Samuel talk. Ain't no use him talking and you not listening. He's wasting your time and his breath and yours too. Do what you want to do. That's what I, I've told people. I say, hey, brother, just do whatever you feel like doing. I could tell they was resenting it, kind of pulling back. It's all right with me. Hey, I'm not in the arm twisting business. I'm not going to blackmail people. I tell them if they leave our church, I say, hey, we meet in the grocery store. We're not going to act like a bunch of kids. I'm going to walk up and shake your hand and say, love, love you, you, brother. Love you, sir. Yeah. Yep. Amen. Well, hallelujah. I know pastors that tell people, don't you speak to this, don't you do this. Come on, get the victory. You get people praying. You ain't got to worry about all that stuff. You see those great two people, brother and sister Shoemake, some of the greatest people in Pentecost. You don't think it, you're talking about a prayer warrior. I've been out there, brother Shoemake's been in his prayer room and listened to Elder Shoemaker in there, crying out to God, stirred my soul, go to the next. Thank you, Brother Go there. You don't think I'd stop and listen to Brother Kenny Go there? You better believe I would. I want to show you men that have influenced my life and can speak into my life. You know who that is? That's Von Morton. Go to the next. You know who that is? Brother Buxton. Go to the next. You know who that is? One of the great men of God, Phil White. You know who that is? Brother Nate Wilson. You know who that is? Thank God for Brother King. You know who that is? You don't know who that is. That's a wild man. That man is wild. He's wild about God. Brother Rick Mayo. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. Let me tell you something. Saul didn't lose out because he had trouble. Because when you lead the life of David, you know what? David starts out. Think about this story. Do I still have your attention? He starts out. How would you like to be a boy in Jesse's house and be the youngest? Because he, he says, Dad, where are y'all going? Oh, we're going to meet Samuel, he's come to make a sacrifice at Bethlehem. Well, can I go? No, son, you can't go. Take them sheep and you go out there and take care of the sheep. Okay, Dad. How would you like to be in that house? Then you see, 
And the Bible described him, said he was the best harp player in all of Israel. When they wanted a harp player, they had to find David to come to his house. They rolled up. They said, come go with us. They said he, and, and it describes him in that verse as a man of war. Does it not? Yeah. Guess what happens when they go to war? Yeah, they say, well, Dad, can I go with them? No, son, you're too young. Go take care of the sheep. Okay, Dad, I'll go. Oh, you won't never go wrong listening, young people. When they say don't go, don't go. When they say go home, go home. When they say be in at 10 o'clock, be in at 10 o'clock. Then he says, son, come here, David. Take these crackers and, uh, yeah, let me put my two cents in there. These mayonnaise sandwiches. If you don't like mayonnaise, there's something wrong with you. You're not going to make it. Ain't nothing like mayonnaise sandwiches. Go check on your brothers. Okay, Dad, I'll do it. He takes the carriage. He takes servants with him because the Bible said when he got out of that carriage, he left, he left it with the servants that were with him. Hey, you hold the carriage. I'm going to go check on my brothers. He's coming there with a big smile on his face. Brothers, I just want to know how you're doing. Daddy sent you a special lunch. Eliab, what did he say? What are you doing down here, David? Go home and take care of them few sheep you got. <laughs> David, he's shocked. He said, well, is there not a cause? Don't tell me he wasn't feeling something in his spirit. He hear, heard the roar of that giant. He knew why he was down there. Hey, we need some young people that'll stand up that won't sit down. That's willing to fight the giant of internet. Oh yeah, I'm gonna hit it again. Fight the giant of worldliness. Fight the giant of listening to the ball games. That's a bunch of carnality. I'm going to tell you real quick a message God gave me. I was praying and I said, where do men worship? And I was thinking about where, where do people worship? And I got a secretary to call all the churches in Little, greater Little Rock that answer their phone and said, how many people do you have coming on Sunday morning? Of course, now it's like Pentecost. They don't even have it on Sunday night. Well, some people do. Hallelujah. Oh, I know, it's too much trouble. <laughs> hey, hold it, hold it. It's not too much trouble when you're having a party. It's too much trouble to go on Sunday morning when you got to hear some dry preacher that hadn't cried and prayed and sought God for a message and got his, well, hallelujah. It's too much trouble to go, period. But it's not if they're having a party. You know, recently we just had a family come back to God. You know really what led them back to God? I met them and Holy Ghost sent me there. A lady in our church had been on a 52-day fast where she had given up something. It was Saturday, and I met her son. And I said, to Kyle, why are you not coming to church? And he's a businessman, he's doing great, he's got a big agency and doing amazing. And uh, I talked to him a little bit and he said, well, I've got my children in Catholic school. I'm going to tell you when he said that, I got nauseated. Catholic school. Well, you know what's going to happen to them. He was raised in this, but he's fixing to raise some Catholics now. And I said, man, you don't need to do that. You need to get them children in our school. Did you know he listened to me? I sent him the principal, Brother Pomeroy's number. He called Brother Pomeroy. He got with his wife. They met the next day. They, he showed, of course, he already knew the rules. 
because we don't bend the rules. Everybody's got to live by the rules. Hey, hey, let me tell you. You know what he did the next day? He come over there. I said, Brother Pomeroy, be sure you go over them rules. We're not trying to trick nobody into this. You got to have it down here. Hey, I found out he had it down here. He said, he went, I said, Brother Pomeroy, what did he say? He said, ain't nothing to them rules. One of the rules is you got to come to church. You got to be there. You can't miss very many services and stay in that school. He said, that ain't nothing. We can do it. I took him out to eat Monday night. He and his wife. You know what he said? Y'all be seated. You're making me nervous. Like you want me to quit. You know what he said to me? He said, Brother Holmes, me, of course, she's over there. She's clapping her hands. And he's come down front praying already. And he said, Brother Holmes, it, it's a party. I said, yeah, yeah. He said, it's like a concert. Every night when we go to church, we can't hardly wait to hear the, the singers. Not worthy singers, Holy Ghost. People that's been to the church praying. David, and you know, here, here's, and here's what I've been trying to get to. I guess y'all try and figure that out too, aren't you? The conclusion I came to by Saul and David was this. Saul did not go through enough trouble. Because when David went through all the trouble, 16 years he was chased by a crazy man. And he had done nothing wrong. Zero. I'm going to tell you, when you're suffering and you know you ain't done nothing wrong, that puts another spin on things. But when you know you're connected up, I tell you, I've had the devil here lately hit me with everything he could hit me with. Y'all would be surprised if I told you some of the things he's hit me with. But you know what I tell the devil in front of all you people? Come on, devil. Because right where you hate me, I hate you. And I promise you I'm not going to give in by the help and grace of God. I'm not going to back up. Let hell come, let hell go. That song says I'm anchored, I'm anchored. If Saul, be seated, if Saul would have went through the trouble that David had went through, you know what happened to Saul? It was handed to him. Here, I was out looking for mules and ended up being a king. Wow. Here, you got, you got the kingdom in your hands. Hey, it's hard to appreciate something you didn't sweat over. Can I tell you, trouble is your best friend? Oh, I know we hate it, but it's, it's your best friend. Trouble will propel you forward if you do the right thing. Because when trouble hits, you'll bow up. You'll put the devil where he belongs, under your feet. Trouble is your friend. It'll propel you forward. Many years ago, I heard the story about a little boy and his kite. He bought a kite, and he was so proud of it, and he started flying that kite. The kite got way up in the air. And the kite started talking back to the boy and said, if you'll turn me loose, I'll soar into the heavens. The kite said, oh, no, I don't want to turn you loose. You're mine. I purchased you. I got a right for you to be loyal to me and not let somebody else have you for their kite. I'm still preaching. I've sweated with you. 
talk to you. I'll be encouraged. And you're just going up and get away? No. You're mine. We're together. We're a team. And he's holding the string. And finally, the kite talks him into turning it loose. He turns it loose. And the kite soars just a little. And then it starts twisting and turning and flopping, turning. And it hits the ground, broken. He runs over to the kite. And the kite says, now I see. What was holding me back was really holding me up. You think your mother and dad, you think your pastor's holding you back. They're really holding you up. You need to support them. You need to stick with them. Trouble's your best friend. You know what the devil wants. The devil wants your dream is what he wants. Come here, Brother Jackson, help me out. Thank God for my dear daughter. I said, hey, you're going to be Joseph, brother. Oh, ma'am. Y'all see that? I want every one of you young people to take a look because the Holy Ghost spoke to me. God's, he's got a special coat of many colors for your life. Trouble can't take it away. You're the only one that can wreck your life. The Holy Ghost wants me to tell you, he's got a coat of many colors. You know what else the Holy Ghost spoke to me? That God has already put a dream in your heart for what he wants you to do. You already feel it in your spirit. And if you listen to the devil, he will rob you because you're David and you get pushed to the back. But go ahead and let him push you to the back. I'm going to tell you, God can find you in the back. He don't care what color your skin is. He don't care what the last name is. He's got a coat of many colors for you. Hold on to your dream. Hold on to your dream. You know, you may see that I started preaching when I was 16 years old. Dysburg, Tennessee was the first place I preached. It went pretty good the first night. Second night, I went back with my mother. She drove me up there. I said, I ain't doing this anymore. I'd already embarrassed myself good enough. But I'll tell you how to keep from getting embarrassed. You know how to do it? Die every day. It don't matter what nobody says to you. It don't matter what they do to you. You can love them in spite of anything they do if you get up every day and say, I'm going to die. You know what God done? There was a young couple in that church that had been praying for the Holy Ghost for five years. Five years. Can you imagine? Beautiful, fine-looking young couple. And we was praying for them. The next night I preached again. They come to the altar. We laid hands on them. Mother was praying for them. I was praying for them. Guess what? The man went to speaking in tongues. I'm sorry, it was the woman that went to speaking in tongues. 
Because when she got the Holy Ghost, he was still over there praying, you know, kind of like a, you know. And uh, mother said to him, said, go tell your husband how you, to get the Holy Ghost. And she went over and told him. She grabbed him. She said, let your tongue wag. Oh, I know you don't like it, no matter whether you like it or not, but he went to speaking in tongues. Somebody said they didn't really get the Holy Ghost. Well, let me tell you, I was having camp meeting 20 years later, and that couple showed up at the church and said, do you remember us? We were there that night, and we were the ones that got the Holy Ghost. Hey, the devil's going to do everything he can possibly to do to get your coat of many colors. You know, I was preaching, uh, you know, 18 years old or so, 17. Been to Brother Duplessis' three-week revival. We had 28 to get the Holy Ghost. School teacher got the Holy Ghost. It shook that city. God was moving. It just It's a hand of God. Glory be to God. God had blessed me. My daddy had blessed me. He bought, bought me a 1965 red and white, white vinyl roof, red body, Coupe de Ville Cadillac with a leather interior. Big old engine in it. I've always liked them big old engines. Well, you know, I'm doing good. There was a notable man, if I mention his name, I think everybody, all you preachers would know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to do that. He's already gone on. God bless his heart. But he said to some of the people, he said, I tell you, when Joel Holmes marries that Burr girl, well, that's what they couldn't stand. They said, do you mix that Burr and Holmes together? There's going to be some explosions. I mean, I used to tell my wife, she was raised real structured, you know, like a nursing home. They knew, <laughs> they knew when they were going to eat. They knew when they were going to get up. They knew when they were going to go to bed. I'm going to tell you, I was raised at a bus station. There's coming day and night. There's blowing the horns. I'd waken up in the night. I can still remember waking up one night looking over there, and they had put John David Williams in the bed with me. He used to pastor here in this city. It really ruffled a bunch of feathers. That wild bunch, that Holmes bunch. Man, they did not want me to get Janet. She was the only child. They were all sophisticated. They were real dignified. Brother Byrne, all of them, you know, educated. You know what he said about me? He said, when Joel Holmes marries Janet, I guess they'd give up by that time. He said, you know what Brother Burr's going to do to him? He's going to take that tambourine away from him. This is his words. Y'all wait just a minute. I just happen to have a tambourine. You know what he said? He said, they're going to take it. Brother Burr will take that tambourine away from him, and he'll give him a dictionary. Hey. At 71, I can laugh about it tonight, but I want to tell you, it wasn't no laughing matter. But they were really, he was really telling the truth because I was never cut out to be a preacher. I was cut out to work at Walmart. But you see where I ended up? Hey, you know what he didn't know? I had a tambourine and I had my dictionary too and everywhere I was going people was getting the Holy Ghost fire was falling I'm going to tell you the deal is whatever you do you just be sure you stay with God and your pastor you can be seated because the devil's wanting that coat of many colors. Come out here, Brother Jackson. I want him to see it. Walk around here just a little bit. Because God spoke to me. God gave this to me tonight. This is your life. You want it to be beautiful? 
You want it to be colorful? You want great things to happen in your life? You want fine homes and fine cars and money in your pocket? Whatever you do, you hang on to your Samuel. Hey, when you're blessed, you're blessed. It doesn't matter what your enemies say. <laughs> they may want to cut your throat, but they ain't nothing they can do. God will bless you. I'm going to tell, I want you to get it tonight. This is your life. If you don't mess it up, this is your life. Young people, you ain't got nothing to worry about. If you'll hang on to your pastor, if you'll stay in your church, when he says go feed the sheep, you just go feed the sheep. Don't worry about it. I thought they'd ask me to lead the choir. Don't worry about it. Just go feed the sheep. I thought they'd ask me to teach the Sunday school. No, just go feed the sheep. When God gets ready for you, he can find you wherever you're at. You can be seated. Let me tell you something. Jochebed knew the importance of it. She said, I want to tell you one thing. Pharaoh, you may have got them other babies, but you're not going to get my baby. And Miriam, his, her other, her daughter, she followed. You know, here, here's the thing. Here's the way it works. When you pray in the Holy Ghost and you seek God, God will give you special design. It's something you don't read in a book. It's something you feel in your heart. She didn't read nowhere it said, hey, make an ark and shove him out there in the Nile River. And boy, it'd be art. No, no, I'll, she had been praying off. Jochebed, off the drawing board of her heart, she had wrote this. She had planned this. She was the one that made the little ark. And she was the one that took it down there and had Miriam to stand on the bank and watch that baby. And here, oh, you don't think God can work, just watch him work. Here comes Pharaoh's daughter down there to bathe. And at the right time, Moses cries, whoo, that sounds like a baby. Bring that baby to me. And then Miriam is standing on the side and said, do you need somebody to nurse it? Oh, boy, that's a message right there, but I got to quit. I'm not getting paid by the hour. In fact, I'm not going to get paid no way. Egypt don't know how to nurse no baby. That's why I'm such a strong believer in a Christian school. They don't know how to take care of no Moses. They can't nurse no baby. It's Jochebed that knows how to nurse that baby. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Thank God for Christian education and Christian homes and putting it down in their heart. You can be seated. And then you know what else happened to Miriam? It was Miriam. She was prophesying. Oh, I want to tell you ladies something. Don't you let the devil lie to you. God can use you just like he can these young men. You can be a Deborah. You can be an Esther. You can be a Jochebed. You can be a Miriam. And Miriam... You know what happened. They crossed that Red Sea. I was praying about 30 years ago on a Sunday afternoon. I said, God, what do you want me to preach tonight? And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, Preach that if they'll hold on to that tambourine. I mean, they come out on the other side, 
dancing and playing their tambourine. You know what they were at? They were at the party. But just because you file bankruptcy doesn't mean you put down your tambourine. Just because they tell you you got colon cancer, you don't put down your tambourine. And you know what? The, be seated. You know what the Holy Ghost told me? It said they went three days' journey and they didn't find no water. And then they found water and it was bitter. And that's the first time the Bible said they murmured and they complained. And you know what God spoke to me? Church, get your tambourine. You may be drinking chemo. I said, I'm going to eat that stuff like it's jello. But I'm going to tell you something. That is some bitter jello. Anybody that's been there knows what I'm talking about tonight. I've had four treatments so far, and they want to do eight more. Hallelujah to God. But I want to tell you one thing. Sister Johnette and I go up there and sit in the car tie and they hook me up. Then I go home with that thing for two days and it's going in my system. But I can tell you one thing, I took my tambourine with me every time I went. I said, I'm going to drink this bitter chemo. I ain't judging God. I'm not going to back up. I said, you know what I said? I said, I'm going to put it on the end of the devil's nose and beat it in his nose. <laughs> hey, sit down. I got to get through and y'all keep hindering me. Let me tell you something. When you got bitter water, that's not the time to put your tambourine down. <laughs> Musicians, y'all come on. That's not the time to put your tambourine down when you can't figure it out and the devil's trying to get your coat of many colors. You be a Joseph and say, I'm not going to backslide. I may be down here in Potiphar's house and they may have ripped up my coat, but they didn't get it out of my heart. I still got it here. I'm going to beat it in his face. When your life is upside down, when you're going through a divorce and people are pointing their fingers saying, what did you do wrong? And people are making accusations. Well, God finally got him. Do whatever you want to. Say whatever you want to. I got a death grip on my tambourine. You know what it represents? It represents the joy of the Holy Ghost. You know what? Thank the Lord. I had a man in the church, Brother Mark Brockenden. He said, you want to go to the Mayo Clinic? You want to go to the MD Anderson, wherever you want to go? I'll get it set up. I said, I don't want to go nowhere. I want to stay right here at the Rock. I want to stay around them prayer warriors. <laughs> Don't get me off in Houston or New York somewhere. Man, that doctor operated on me. He said, I got all the cancer. You ain't got any cancer. But he said, you may have had a sale that got bias. And he said, I want you to do this chemo because of that. Well, I'm glad to tell you, two weeks after that surgery and four chemo treatments, I have not missed one service. And I'm standing at peak tonight. Take that, devil! Come on, tambourines. Hey, wait, 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 wait. I don't want y'all to come run. I got one more thing to do. Be seated. Singers, where y'all at? Hurry, hurry, hurry! I'm wearing these
people out. Run. Yes, yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, let me tell you this. I think it was this past Friday. I woke up. I've been getting up about four every morning. I haven't been going to the church, but I've been going in the den. Spending a couple hours in there talking to God. Well, Friday morning, four o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I was singing this song. This is what woke me up. And the Lord started giving me the words to the verses they're going to sing tonight. Hallelujah. Come here, son. Son, come here. I thank God. Thank God for my son. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, son. Hallelujah. And I got up and went in the den and started writing. Now, I, I'm, I work at Walmart. That's what I'm going to start. You know, I need to do on the weekends or something. I wouldn't cut out to be a preacher. I know that. He didn't have to say that about that dictionary. No, I didn't know how to speak very well or have very good grammar. You know, I found out if you know yourself, people want to have to tell you who you are. So I know myself. I know who I am. But it also sets you free. You ain't afraid of nobody. You're not intimidated by nobody. I've got to sit down again. Where's my tambourines? Y'all okay. sit down. And so God gave me the words. And uh, this good brother, where, where? Here he is, Brother Howell and Brother Kirk Kenha. I sent them to them. Amen. Come here, brother. Thank you. Him and Brother Kenha, they took the words that the Lord had given me and they smoothed out all the edges. Boy, y'all made it sound good. Oh, geez. I want them to sing it for you. Amen. And I want you to just be seated. Hallelujah. Go ahead, singers. Hallelujah. And buried deep in sin But we are apostolic Our tambourines will ring We'll shake them in the devil's face And claim our victory There is a sound That makes walls fall
for which no man shall see God. First Corinthians 11, 6. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Doth not nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto them? Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost.
Yeah. 
you need to join up with somebody right now. Don't you miss a miracle moment. There's a miracle moment in this house right now. There's enough miracles for everybody in this building. You just got to release the sound for it right now. Come on, don't anybody pray by themselves right now. You need to join up. Two's better than one. Come on, obey the Holy Ghost, young people. Now's not the time to be pretty. Now's the time to get your deliverance. Now's the time to get your calling. Now's the time for you to commit your life that you're going to serve God all the days of your life. Hear the sound of Pentecost in this house. Come and tongues like as a fire settling upon believers in this building.